5 p.m. in Ecuador, 10 p.m. in Accra, and midnight in Berlin, Germany, from the News Hub at Adesawe in Kanda, Accra. This is News at 10 with me, Grace Hamwa Asari. Let's take a look at the news highlights for today. In the house tonight, health experts say controlling COVID-19 has become challenging because of asymptomatic coronavirus careers. Dr. Isaac Newman indicated patients not showing symptoms are very infectious and since it's difficult to identify them, it is important for the public to strictly adhere to lay down protocols to protect themselves. Also, Chief Superintendent of Prison says adhering to social distancing protocol as directed by the President is challenging due to congestion in prisons across the nation. At the Awutukam Prison, CSP Williams Thomas Anaman says that over 200 inmates capacity prison has reduced its intake to 120 due to COVID-19. And fall armyworm and climate change has affected 84 hectares of maize farms in the Kuo West municipality of the eastern region. The maize farms are owned by 123 maize farmers. And former head of political desk at Media General Edward Kwabi has been interred at the Osu Cemetery. He was eulogized by family, friends and loved ones as they paid their last respect. So these were the stories topical on the local front. Let's find out what has been trending on the international front tonight. And the Food and Drugs Administration, FDA of the US, has authorized emergency use of the Ebola drug for treating the coronavirus. The authorization means the antiviral drug can now be used on people who are hospitalized with severe COVID-19. A recent clinical trial showed the drug helped shorten the recovery time for people who were seriously ill. However, it did not significantly improve survival rates. Away from that, more than 40 people were reportedly killed after rioting broke out at a prison in Venezuela. Inmates at Los Silanos Jail near Western Guanari City were angry at a lack of food and water, according to the Venezuelan Prison Observatory. The organization called for an investigation, casting doubts on the official version that the prisoners had attempted a jailbreak. So these are the stories topical and trending on both the local and international front. Let's go to the website of the Ghana Health Service and find out what's happening there when it comes to Ghana's case count concerning or regarding COVID-19. So on the website, our case count is still at 2,169 cases. And the Greater Accra region is the region with the highest number of cases, 1,852 cases. Ashanti region is second, and the Eastern region is third. And then and we have Western region with the least number of cases. That is nine cases. Four regions are yet to record cases, as already mentioned. When you come here, um, gender distribution, we have female forming 39% of those who have contracted the virus and male 61%. So when it comes to travel history, we have 12 people who have history of travel and then we have 88% of people who have no travel history, which means that these cases are the ones that make up cases we refer to as community infections or the interspread community. So that's the latest when it comes to the update on Ghana's case regarding COVID-19.
19. So that's it. But to other stories now, let's look at other stories. What's happening now on the local front and limiting face-to-face -face contact with others, according to health experts, is the best way to reduce the spread of coronavirus. But for some fisher folk at Mumford in the Goma East District, adhering to the fiscal distancing protocol is proving to be difficult. The news team has been finding out why. At a fishing day at Mumford in the Goma East District of the Central Region, fishmongers have all gathered here waiting for the latest catch to arrive. The only problem here is that the fisher folk are not practicing physical distancing. One of the best tools to avoid being exposed to the virus and slowing its spread locally, according to health experts, is through physical distancing. This means staying at least six feet, about two arms length, from other people. A member of the tax force responsible to ensure residents adhere to the physical distancing protocol seem helpless. I'm in the town. We are about uh, 14. We have been to the beach all the time. We have been telling them they have to separate themselves. They have to wash their hands. They have to cover their nose. In fact, whenever you are talking to them, they will do to the reject you. So in fact, I have talked a lot still. They never obey me. We asked some fisher folk why practicing physical distancing is difficult. <laughs> We do not fear the virus because the seawater will kill it. We will only record cases when someone from Europe visits our community. Government should provide us with masks. At the children and the youth that are not adhering to the physical distancing protocol, the elderly people are around to chase them when they come close together. The district chief executive for Gomoa East, Besma Kinkum, said the assembly will strengthen its education to residents to sensitize them on the coronavirus. Education, we've been doing it ongoing, but this erroneous impression that see, if you go and swim, you cannot have this and that, that is something that we continue to educate the people. And we'll continue to do the education till they accept the reality that, okay, this is not about the seawater, but it really has got to do with the virus that can affect your, your, your lungs. Well, interesting comments there from the people at Mount Ford. Let's do a lot of analysis on this and speak with the Executive Secretary of the Bureau of Public Safety, Nanaya Akwada, who is joining me on Skype. Nana, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Okay, so now you heard from you heard what the people said. The fact about um, they not having the scare that they might contract the virus and all that. How does this go to undermine the fight against COVID nineteen? Well, um, very unfortunate mm -hmm. um, situation. Uh, very unfortunate that the trend has been on the increase since we came out of the lockdown. Uh, one would want to say that it's an area that as a country we need to um, take very stringent measures, uh, especially when in our situation we know for the records that majority of our patients are asymptomatic where they are not showing any symptoms. I think that, that we need to do a lot more community engagement, um, you know, diverted into area of health, education, and promotion. If we are able to do this, you know, moving the campaign or the engagement from mass media uh, to the community level, we will be able to make the impact. We must be reminded of the fact that we do not have time on our side. Mm. And Lena, it, it appears that it's becoming very difficult for people to adhere to their social distancing protocol. Doesn't this show that um, probably it, it's a thing that has become a part of us and so really it's going to take a lot of time before we're able to really get to adhere to it, even in the face where our cases are still going up? 
Well, let me say that I have not seen any country where um, enforcing fiscal distancing has been easy. Mm. It's as difficult as enforcing a lockdown, but we must do it. It's a necessary measure that as a country, we must do it in order to come out of this um, pandemic on escape or, uh, you know, not to escape significantly. So we must find ways and means of ensuring that we are able to get our members of society to fiscally distance. Mm. Look, where we keep the campaign or the engagement mm. to just the mass media, we will be seeing the kind of spectacles we are seeing. What has happened to this campaign at our Lorry Park? What has happened to this campaign at our market? Mm. You know, we have failed to utilize two solid weeks to, you know, uh, plan, or three weeks to plan how these markets are going to run, to plan how our fisher foods should, um, you know, engage or apply themselves along with uh, uh, the women who go and buy fishes. We failed to utilize that period, knowing very well that we were going to open up. So now that we've opened up, then we must up our game by embarking on a robust health education and promotion um, campaign and be, community be, engagement. Before I let you go, let's talk about people who are asymptomatic. It's becoming a trend or a big issue now, and especially in the community where we're all around everybody and all that. So what would you advise people they do regarding people with asymptomatic? You, 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 you don't know who has a symptom and who, who is showing it and who is not showing it. What would you say should be the advice? Well, basically, I think that's why we have been giving these protocols to follow. Um, first of all, we are asked to stay home if it's not necessary. Two, we are asked to fiscally distance. And three, we are asked to wear our nose mask, you know, every time we move out or we have to engage with people in close proximity. I think that these are very, very cogent. And we must be reminded of the fact that the, the use of the nose mask is the last resort, and it does not guarantee us 100% protection. So it's not as if when people go out there in their nose mask, they feel superhuman, they feel that they are actually protected against this virus. People must be educated to understand that the mask is only one of the little measures that we need to um, the least protective measures that we are asked to use when uh, maintaining fiscal distance is difficult, then we use masks. But it actually does not protect us 100%. I think we must um, get this drum into society's um, psyche in order to win this campaign. Then thank you very much for speaking with us. Nane Alkoda is thank Executive you. Secretary of the Bureau of Public Safety. This is News at 10 on TV3. We're back with more after this break. Don't go away. Welcome back. This is News at 10 on TV3 and we're also live on DSTV channel 279. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused adverse impact on the private healthcare sector, resulting in drop of revenue. Though healthcare is the focus of private hospitals, they also survive on the finances of patients. The already strained healthcare industry has been feeling the negative economic impact of COVID-19. While the government is taking cognizance of financial burden in sectors like hospitality, tourism, construction, little has been discussed regarding the distress felt by the private healthcare sector. Some people have argued that the private health sector has stood beside the government contained the virus and is committed to the war against COVID-19. Officials at the Front National Hospital, for instance, say though they are faced with difficulty in getting access to PPEs, they are still putting in their best to fight the virus. Previously, when patients come to the hospital, some of them come with uh, all sorts of issues, not only medical, some of them have 
personal issues, emotional issues, and they need to be touched sometimes when you're talking to them. But in these times, as we always say, it's not a normal time. So you can't even touch the person to console the person. She says the finances of the hospital are obviously affected. We take money. Uh, a few of them use insurance. But then we get their numbers when they visit the hospital. So definitely, if they're not visiting the hospital, then you don't have numbers. But we understand they are no normal times. A private medical doctor also expressed the difficulty in carrying out his duty in a COVID-19 era. There are so many angles to look at a difficulty. But um, of course, one of the uh, striking ways to look at it is how to handle, you know, getting suspected cases, yeah. And so far as that is concerned, for us, we've um, done our best, just like, you know, most other hospitals have done, to create a lot of awareness concerning the disease. A laboratory scientist emphasized the need to have PPEs extended to private hospitals. Because of the caution for people to avoid crowded places, um, people who have some sickness or complaint these days would prefer to come to the private facilities because if you look at most of our public hospitals and clinics, there are huge numbers normally of patients hanging in there. Though some PPEs have been supplied to the private hospitals, they come with costs. This also goes a long way to compound the financial challenges COVID-19 has already had on them. And Chief Superintendent of Prison says adhering to social distancing protocols as directed by the President is challenging due to congestion in prisons across the nation at the Ewutu Camp Prison. CSP William Thomas Anaman says the over 200 inmates capacity prison has reduced its intake to 120 due to COVID-19. It is 1.30 p.m. here at Ewutu Prison's camp. Because of COVID-19, I am not allowed to go in there to interact with the inmates. How are they adhering to the safety protocols and all directives given by the president? For the social distance, it's a bit difficult. And I don't think that any prison in the developed country can adhere to the social distancing method of helping to stem the tide of this, this issue. But in a way, we make sure that the officer's prisoner contact is reduced drastically so that uh, the uh, officers who happen to get attacked will not bring it and infest them. Disinfecting facilities as congested as prisons, markets and other public institutions would be a one sure way to fighting coronavirus, according to Westbet. Unfortunately, the Abutu Camp Prison is yet to undertake any disinfection exercise. However, Chief Superintendent of Prisons, CSP Williams Thomas Anaman says the facility has ensured inmates are able to wash their hands regularly under running water. CSP Anaman described the everyday life of inmates. Early in the morning, we are taking out the workshops. You make sure that you are, you are, you are engaging, you said you are engaging for a period of hours so that at least that laziness and will get out of you when you get out so that you can, you can fit yourself into the society very well. At the time of our visit, the OT Development NGO had come to make some donations to the facility. It's necessary we do this in this difficult time because they are also part of Ghanaians and so they need to be part of the system and they must equally observe all precautionary measures. Items donated included some Veronica buckets, soaps and toiletries. CSP Anaman had an appeal for churches. It shouldn't be the responsibility of the government alone. It is the church. That is our business. If the church is not, they, they are not coming. I see that it is something that needed to be done. So and I'm using your platform to tell them that those children are there. They should come and come and support. I am told that here being a prison camp means that inmates who are brought here have about between one to ten years sentences to serve in here. And as you can see behind me, this is about a 200-acre farmlands which has been newly cultivated 
into maize and okra farm by the inmates themselves. They do this so that when they are brought in here, they are able to learn at least farming or some other skills. So by the time their sentences are over, they are able to transform into better persons. And when they are out there, they do not become burdens to themselves, to their families, and to the society. Ajua Konedu Biadom, CV3 News, a Wutu prisons camp. And former head of political desk at Media General, Edward Kwabi, has been interred at the Yusuf Cemetery. He was eulogized by family, friends and loved ones as they paid their last respect. Here is a report by Stanley Nibliu. The solemn ceremony to bid farewell to the late Edward Kwabi was attended by family members, colleagues, friends and sympathizers. His remains were slain in state for a brief file past. Yes, characterized the ceremony. The family, in a tribute, described the late Kwabi as an industrious and true family man. Despite uh, these heavy shadows at work, he made time to have a good time with his family. He would usually send the children to recreational centers to have fun with them. He loved playing video games, doing research on the internet to know what is happening around the world watching boxing and movies, listening to good music, especially gospel and high life. The Ghana Journalists Association, GJA, and colleagues of the press corps to former President John Dramani Mahama also eulogized the falling media practitioner. Young as he was, Edward contributed immeasurably to the development of journalism in this country. He was a professional gem, and indeed he made his mark. Kwabi was intelligent. He proved his academic insights about the dynamics of global happenings and contributed meaningfully to all group discussions within circles of professional colleagues. Media General was represented. <laughs> Associate Pastor of the Ringway Gospel Centre, Usu, Reverend Benjamin Tete, in a sermon titled Late News from Heaven, admonished living to prioritize righteous living as death remains inevitable. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior? Have you received him? Do you have a relationship with him? If not, today is the decision day. His body was later interred at the Osu Cemetery. Therefore, commit his body to the ground. And we say, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust. Edward Kwabi died at age 32 after short illness. He left behind a wife and three children. Edward worked with Media General for nine years and by dint of hard work rose through the ranks to become the head of the political desk. You shall forever remain in our hearts. And it's very difficult for us here at Media General, but we know his soul is resting in peace and we're wishing the family all the best. That will be it for tonight's edition of News at 10. My name is Grace Hamwa. Sorry, thank you for joining us.